In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, asking you to bless this service, dear God, we sure need your touch upon it. And Lord, I do not know uh, this morning the uh, matters of life and the people that are here, but thou knowest. And Lord, some need this, some need that, dear God, decisions to be made, uh, things going in our life right now. But Lord, I pray this morning we'd get some answers from heaven because we sure need it this morning. Bless the service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. It's all, it's all stand and sing. 55. standing let's turn over a couple pages to 57 page number 57 we'll sing let's go ahead and sing all four all four stanzas of Ad calvary amen page number 57 amen. Amen.
God. There my burdened soul found liberty. Amen. Praise God. I'm going to preach about the soul this morning a little bit. Lord, help me. Boy, it's good to see you this morning. And uh, a little bit thin this morning, aren't we here? Crowd a little bit off today. And, and so even the choir is down more than usual. But you know what? The Lord's here. And I'm thankful for that. And uh, we do be mindful of those who are not here. Some of them are sick, not able to be in church. And we want to pray for them. You'll notice in your bulletin, there's a little note in there about the address for Miss Ann Hubbard. Uh, she's over in the facility in, in Somerville right now for a, a while. We don't know yet, so I know she'd appreciate a card. And speaking of cards, uh, Brother Morris's mother is going to turn 95 this year. Amen. And so they're not going to be able to go up uh, for her birthday. And so they're wanting to get 95 birthday cards. Amen. Would you help out with that? Amen. All right. And... Uh, uh, have them here by next Sunday, okay? Just bring them with you. And her name is Maxine. How you pronounce that last name? S P A A G. Spog. Maxine Spog. How about that? That's a good name. Mm hmm. Like Leshewitz. <laughs> Other names. And 95, isn't that wonderful? Amen. All right, now listen. We want to get 95, and so we, we're going to have to maybe do more than one to get that number, okay, one apiece. And so let's get that up, and we'll get that done, and I'm, I'm going to write two cards myself. And uh, that'll be a blessing. Get it here by next Sunday so they can get them to her. All right, well, let's see here. Uh, uh, we had to get revival, didn't we? Yes. Woo, wasn't that some good preaching? And I hope you got some help from it. I believe you did. I hope you did. I trust you did. I know I did. And... Uh, but uh, I appreciate your attendance. I appreciate your, appreciate your attention while you were here and being here, those, some of you who are every service. And then also in the bulletin is a, is a thank you for Mrs. Baker and I for your uh, kindness shown to us last Sunday on Pastor Appreciation Day. And all the cards you got and the gifts you give us is really, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, when I when we get the cards, open the cards up, and, and, and some, some had a lot to say, some had a few words. But here's the thing about a card. If someone ever gives you a card, it doesn't matter if they just signed their name to it. It's a card to you. Okay? And you ought to thank God for that person. Amen? And if they add a few little words to it, that makes it even better. And so I really, I, uh, I appreciate, I, and I keep those cards. I don't throw them away. My wife said, you got to do something. She said, you must have, you must have at least five or 6,000 cards that you've been saving all these years. And so I'm going to recard them. I'm just going to give them, I'm going to sign my name and give them back to you. And you see what you said to me, and I'm going to say it to you. <laughs> People say, you, yeah, you think I'm kidding you. I have got boxes of letters and cards I've kept for like 40 years. And, uh, but anyway, and sometimes I go back and read them. Yeah. Uh, I've got things that you wrote 25 years ago. Some of them nice, but anyway, that's supposed to be a joke. All right. Okay. Let's see here. And we got some nice thank you cards this week from uh, uh, Miss uh, Ann Hensley. We uh, we received another offering for her, so she wrote us back thanking the church for the kindness and the and the gift. And then also Miss Glenda King, Olin King's wife, we sent her and others offering, and and she sent a great card back. And I want you to know that. And uh, so anyway. All right. Let's hear. And I want to speak to you a little bit about Sunday school right now. Okay. Uh, I'd like to see all of you get back in Sunday school, or back if you've never been to Sunday school, get in Sunday school. And uh, I always consider Sunday school a, a valuable hour in church, yes. a valuable hour. And uh, how would you like to be a Sunday school teacher and get and prepare a lesson, and uh, with anticipation of you know uh, a few kids being there and then coming only be and be no kids maybe or just one or two, knowing there should be others there. That could, be, that could be disheartening. And here's another thing about it also. I'm just going to reprimand you a little bit, okay? You realize that, that uh, when you can be in church and you're not here, whether it be for Sunday school or preaching, you can't be here, that that, that goes on your record in heaven. Amen. I mean, the judgment seat of Christ is not going to be a shouting time. It's going to be a weeping time. When God reveals to you all those services you could have been in church and you didn't care, 
You think, well, you know, it's amazing to me that, that parents will get their kids up, you know, crack of daylight to get to school and won't come to Sunday school. It's amazing to me that you'll be at work on time, won't be in church on time. Habitually. You wouldn't keep a job if you did that very long, would you? Huh? So it's very important to be in church. I just like to be a, a preacher and spend hours on a message. And, and as you go through that message, not that he's doing it for that person, as you go through the message, you look at it and you say, you know, a brother so-and-so might could use that point right there. Or miss so-and-so. Or the kids might need that point right there. There's things in that message that come to his mind uh, of, of folks in the congregation. Now, he doesn't know who's going to be there or not, but he's thinking about them. Okay, so he prepares a meal, a spiritual meal, and comes out and looks the congregation over, and uh, so and so's not here. Oh, they're going to miss that today. They'll never get it again. Hmm? Uh, how many of you ladies here would like to prepare a meal, spend all morning, or preparing it through the week? The preacher's coming over for a meal, and uh, you're going to get a good meal together for he and his wife. And he never shows up. Now, you invited him. And he said he'd try to be there. And so you're going to fix it for him. Then you call him and say, preacher, why aren't you here? Oh, oh, I, I was not able to come. We had company drop in. It's getting quiet, isn't it? <laughs> Are you listening to me? And so uh, anyway... Uh, it's very important that you be in Sunday school and in preaching when you can. And there's going to be times you can't be in church. If you're sick, you don't need to be in church. You need to, because if you've got something contagious, you stay home and keep it to yourself. <laughs> Just keep it to yourself. But, uh, uh, you know, you, there's times you might not feel, feel real good, but you need to be in church. And uh, because there's a day coming when you won't be able to come to church, and you'll say, well, I wish I could go to church now. Huh? And there's people out there right now that wish they could be here, but they can't. All right, well, that's my little sermonette for you. All right, choir, you ready to sing? Y'all ready to sing? All right, listen, you got to give them a lot of volume because we have capacity. And y'all know this first song, y'all can help us out. So let's sing this first song. All right.
Brother Brian asked me to do a testimony at this point. Drafted anyway. But um, <laughs> Before that, I must speak a little bit in defense of my Sunday school class. The turnout has actually been quite good uh, for a while now, and it's got to be because they like each other because I've met the teacher. Um, but uh, I would say that uh, I thank the Lord for saving me. September the 12th of 1998. Uh, that is miraculous beyond my ability to conceive because I know what I was up to before then. And it was quite a learning curve for me because I had no church background at all. I'd, I'd never heard the little Sunday school stories or anything, didn't know anything. Um, I was dumb as a rock. I didn't even have head knowledge. I had no knowledge. It was a long learning curve there. And uh, I'm not all that I should be, but I'm glad I ain't what I was. And my, my baby daughter's in the back today and folded up in my wallet I've carried for 20 years now is a tiny little fragment of a note that she wrote when she was a little girl. And what that fragment said was, walk a little straighter, Daddy. I'm watching you. testimonies um, a little different than Mr. Denny's. Um, I grew up in this church from the time I was born. I made a profession at a very young age, but at the age of 28, I was a choir member of choir. I was teaching a three and four year old age Wednesday night class. And I remember specifically in 2015, preacher preached a message on a train ride to hell. And I remember that's the first time I started questioning my salvation. And the first day of camp meeting, 2015, a preacher preached. And I was under so much conviction that I went up to the altar and I was still trying to convince myself that I made a profession when I was 12 years old. And by the time I got home that day, I was so under conviction, I couldn't even eat lunch. <laughs> and I told Chris, I said, something's wrong. I just need, I need a peace, I need a settlement. And Chris took the Bible and led me to Christ right there at the dining room table. That was April the 13th, 2015. And this, this song talks about how much mercy, how much mercy, 28 years old. If something would have happened to me before 28 years old, I would have died and went to hell because of living on a, on a confession. And I'm so grateful that God has made a difference. The things that he's changed in my life. I'm just so grateful that he, he had that much mercy on me.
second verse again um, if that's alright preacher we're going to sing that second verse again the first message uh, brother Wells preached last week was on mercy and, and it just I mean just simple I mean just we're here because of his mercy and he laid out his mercy his mercy his mercy and I've been thinking about that ever since and this song went right along with it. And we sang it last week. That's why we sang it again this morning because the Lord just put it on my heart. I mean, he, he's been so merciful to us yes. this week. This song says, Oh, what a difference. And if you're sitting out there this morning and you're listening, I know we don't have a full capacity choir. We don't have a full capacity congregation, but all we need is him. Yeah. It says two or three are gathered. But just listen to the words of this song and the testimonies and, and just realize how good God's been to you That's since you got saved. But you might be here and you don't understand what we're talking about because you've never experienced mm -hmm. that change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you can today. Yeah. Sure can. You can be saved today. Yeah. Yeah. If you're here today and you're not sure that you're saved, you can be today. Right. And you can experience the difference in your life. Yeah. We're going to sing it again. morning by the mercies of God. I am too. You're breathing because of the mercies of God. Thank you, choir. Thank you for those testimonies too. Oh yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy. I'm, I, 
about that? Isn't that great? Ah, uh -huh, boy. Y'all smile this morning. I gave you, gave you a little, little sermonette right there, and you look like you're mad at me. I hope you're not. If you are, I can't help it. Love you anyway. You know, all right, who had a birthday recently? Anybody have a birthday last week or so? We, maybe we missed you. Who did? Jonathan did. Oh, you pointing at Jonathan. Come on up here, Brother Jonathan. All right. All right, Brother Jonathan. How about that? I tell you what, I'm going to tell you, your wife and your daughter played the piano and the violin good this week. Amen, remember. Yeah, Thank yes, sir. How old are you now, Jonathan? 62. 62. <clears throat> Praise God. You don't look 62. I don't feel 62 because, nope. well, I don't know. I've never been 62 before. But, uh, <laughs> somebody said, and, and uh, when, when I turned 70, somebody said, there's much difference between 70 and 69. I said, no, but 70 and 50 is a lot of difference. Right. Got that right? Amen. 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 Well, listen, we got a basket down here full of junk. Oh. Oh. Get whatever you want in there. I got it. You like Oreos? I love Oreos. Okay. Let me see if I can find a glass of milk under here. Yeah. 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 I might get reincarnated. Yeah. I'll come back with some Oreos. <laughs> Amen. Let's sing happy birthday, Brother Jonathan, okay? Happy birthday to I'll tell you what. Uh, wow. Have another birthday, brother. Isn't that good? Uh, I think if you don't mind, I want to change the next song. And the reason I want to do it, because it's going to go along with my message. Right. And I apologize for not letting you. I normally let him know before now, but I didn't. Uh, yes, sir. You had an anniversary? You did. How about both of you? How many? How many years? 38 years. You don't look that old. No, you don't. No, you don't. No. Yeah. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. Lord help Brother Flowers this morning when he gets home. <laughs> Let's pray for him, okay? All right, all right. Uh, this is 485, 485. I want you to turn that. We're going to receive it. We're going to sing this uh, song. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll sing the first and last verse, and then I'll uh, make a few comments about it when I get ready to preach. This world is not my home. Amen. Can you play it, Ruth? You can? All right, can y'all sing it? All right, let's stand up and sing it then. Get ready to take an offering. <clears throat> this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me on heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, boy, oh, boy. I saw you, Brother Kenny, coming down that aisle over there. You didn't get here as quick as these two little fellas did over here. You, you, yeah, you hobble a little bit. Amen. Yeah, and George hobbles a little bit too, and I hobble a lot. I love you, Kenny. Amen. Amen. Jerry don't hobble. He ran down here like a bullet. Yeah, ready to take that money. <laughs> ready to receive. Yeah. 
and the two lamb boys over here. Amen. Aren't y'all glad you can give? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're glad that this world is not our home. It really isn't. And we're excited because we know there's a home that you've prepared for us who are saved. But Lord, until we get there, help us, enable us to uh, be what we should be for the honor and glory of God. Bless the offering that we're about to receive. Lord, please give us divine, heavenly wisdom not to see it wasted on anything down here on this earth, but to be spent wisely, and Lord, on the things of God. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Miss Ruth. That's wonderful. Jesus is the lighthouse. You know that? And uh, what a blessing it is to know that we have a lighthouse and, and God is through life and Jesus is that lighthouse. I want you to take your Bibles this morning just for a starting place in the book of Genesis chapter 5 and reference there. Then we're going to go over to Job chapter 14. And... Uh, I want to preach this morning on this thought or this subject. Is there life after death? Is there life after death? Now, if I were to ask you to answer that, most of you, I believe, would say, yes, there is life after death. And, uh, but there are people out there, uh, maybe some in your family, some you work with or maybe go to school with, that says, no, there's no life after death. Over in Genesis chapter 5, we find uh, in chapter 5, we'll, I'm not going to read these to you, but we find uh, uh, in, in verse number 4 and 5, we find that Noah, I mean uh, Adam, he lived 400, I mean 930 years, and it says in the latter part of verse 5, what's those last three words? It says, and he died. Now, if you'll go over to chapter, I mean, verse 8, and it says, and he died. In chapter 11, it says, and he died. And then in uh, verse 14, it says, and he died. Then in verse 17, it says, and he died. And then in chapter, uh, verse 20, it says, and he died. And then you get to uh, uh, Enoch, and it says, uh, it didn't say that he died, uh, but it says he walked with God and was not for God took him. He was, he was raptured out, so he didn't die. Then you get to Methuselah in chapter, verse 27, 969 years, but it says, and he died. Then you go down to verse number 31, and it says, and he died. 
The point I'm trying to make is that these fellows lived uh, seven, eight, nine hundred years, but it said, and he died. Now, over in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it says this, God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of what? Life. And watch this. And man became a living soul. And so I want to deal with that matter this morning about the, is there life after death? And uh, the world doesn't believe it is. Unbelievers say that death ends all there is to man. In other words, there's, there's millions upon millions of people out there who will tell you uh, there is uh, there's no evidence of, of life after death. No evidence. Well, that's, why, that's where faith comes in. Amen? I've never been to heaven. I've never seen hell. I've seen heaven through the pages of God's Word. I've seen hell through the pages of God's Word. I've never seen heaven with my natural eye, uh, nor, my, uh, nor hell. But I believe there's a heaven. I believe there's a hell. And they say that the soul functions as the brain. In other words, there's nothing but difference between your brain and your soul, but there is. There is a difference, okay? And uh, the evolutionists believe there's no God and death should not worry anybody. In other words, you should never be worried or concerned about life after death since there's, they, they don't believe that. And so that's why life means, means nothing to them. Matter of fact, when you believe in evolution, you completely do away with the, with the concept of a soul. You're saying that man is just a being. Man is no different than, than the dog and the cat and the giraffe and the monkey and all that. And uh, so they said, don't worry about it. But I want to say to you, you do have a soul. I was just reading through this here is uh, Spiritual Riches of John Bunyan. And, uh, and he had several things to say about the soul. And uh, let me just give you a little excerpt here about what John Bunyan said. He said, the greatness of the soul is manifest by the greatness of the price that Christ paid for it uh, to make it uh, uh, an heir of glory. And that was his precious blood. We do use uh, to esteem things according to the price that is given for them, especially when we are convinced that the purchase has not been made by the estimation of a fool. Now the soul is purchased by a price that the son of that the son, the wisdom of God, thought fit to pay for the redemption thereof. Uh, what a thing then is the soul. What John Bunyan is saying here is this: that uh, uh, your soul is so valuable that it, uh, the highest price uh, was paid for, and that price was the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, the very Son of God. So when you uh, look at the value of something, what, would it, what, what does it cost for that? You realize it costs God his only son, it costs Jesus his only life, that your soul could be purchased. Now, I preached on the soul a few weeks back, and I don't want uh, to go back and repeat myself. I want to say some things to you about that, uh, that, that uh, your body is valuable. It really is, and, and you want to take care of your body. Uh, but your body, you, you see, salvation doesn't take care of your body. You understand? Jesus died for your soul. Now, he said, I want you to have life and have it more abundantly, and you can have the abundant life, but I got news for you. We just found out uh, uh, that uh, 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 another birthday came to Jonathan. Jonathan's getting older. Now, what's getting older? His body is, his soul is not getting old, and neither is your soul. Amen. Your soul is, in, is, is a part of you, your triune being, your body, soul, and spirit. And so uh, Jesus died for your soul. Now, one of these days, we're going to get a brand new body, amen? Yeah. So that's when our salvation will be complete. And so the soul is the most treasured possession you have. Not your car, not your house. Not, in, not your clothes, not anything. The most treasured possession you have is your soul. Your body is temporal, but the soul is eternal. Yeah. Amen, amen. Uh, go pick up the newspaper, look over there in the obituary column, and you'll find these are people who have died in recent days. Their body died, but their soul didn't die. Amen. Their body died. 
and the obituary can say all kind of things about them and give you information about them, but uh, that, uh, that doesn't make them in heaven or in hell. And so, uh, now, notice over in the book of Job, if you'll turn there, in Job uh, chapter 14, and I'll give you a little chance to get there, okay? Job chapter 14 and verse 14, uh, you know this verse, Job asked this question, and uh, he said in Job 14, 14, uh, he said, uh, if a man die, shall he live again? Then notice what he says, all the days of my appointed time will I wait, now watch this, will I wait till my what? Change come. Job knew there was going to be a change to come, and he mentions that again later in the book of Job. And so we understand the soul is your most valuable possession. There is life after death. Uh, go to Job chapter 19. Watch this. Now, he answers his question. Job chapter 19. He answers his question here uh, in verse 25. He said, for I know that my Redeemer, what? liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Huh? Got to bear in mind, Job never had a Bible. Job, Job doesn't have what we have. He didn't have the book of Revelation. He, he didn't have the words of Jesus. He didn't, but uh, God instilled in him. And though uh, after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. So Job says, I'm going to see him. My Redeemer lives, and I'm going to see him one day. He said, this body is going to go back. The worms are going to eat this body. Dust, uh, and so that's what's going to happen. And so there is life after death. A life here uh, is a time of preparation to die. Now, most folks on this earth... Uh, they, they, they start out as children and all depends on, on how you're raised and uh, where you're raised on, on what you're preparing for. But you know what most, uh, most uh, parents do when, the, when they have a, a child that comes their way in the family, either through a birth or through an adoption, that those parents start preparing that child. Watch this. They prepare that child to live and not to die. They teach that child manners. They teach that child all kind of stuff. They send that child to school. They try to point that child in, in a decent direction. Now, if they're saved parents, they want to point that child in the direction of God. They want to see the child saved. Uh, they talk about the Lord. They raise them in church. Are you with me? Are you with me? So they're teaching. But the most of the world today, they teach their children. They prepare them to live here, and they don't prepare them to die. Amen. Are you prepared to die? I'm not asking if you're prepared to live. You're living. But are you prepared to die going home today? If there was an automobile accident and you were to be killed in that accident, where would you spend eternity? Huh? It doesn't matter where they bury your body. Right. Doesn't matter what they put on your tombstone. I want to know is where you're going to live. Where, you, where your soul going to be translated to. Is there life after death? We know he says that. So are you ready to die? And so with every, listen, with every heartbeat, someone somewhere today dies. I was over in a church many years ago, Hanahan Baptist Church over in Hanahan. We were having the fellowship over probably 25 years ago or more. And, uh, and they had a, a light in a hallway back there, and it was just blinking. Just like this, blinking. And curiosity got the best of me, so I asked the pastor, I said, preacher, I said, why, why is that light blinking in that hallway there? And he said, well, some years ago, a previous pastor had put that there and put that little blinker thing on it. And what it was, every time that light blinked, somebody died in the world. It was a reminder to folks who came in that building and saw that light flashing, that somewhere, someone in the world died. 
But because of population explosion, you could probably put five lights up, have them all five blinking, and that's how many die every breath around the world. There is life after death. And one of these days, you're going to, uh, you're going to uh, come to the, to the uh, uh, brink of death or it may come sudden or slowly, but you are going to die. We read there in, in Genesis uh, where it talks about those, and he died, and he died. Now, now uh, uh, Enoch and Elijah did not die. The, the Lord took them, Elijah in a chariot of fire, Enoch was uh, taken out. That's a picture of the rapture, amen. And so they were raptured out. Both, listen now, both of these men, we heard this from Brother Wells, both of these men were on the Mount of Transfiguration and they carried on a conversation with Jesus. Now these two men never knew each other on the earth. They were many, many centuries apart. But when on the Mount of Transfiguration, they knew each other, that, that tells me that they were with, the, with God, amen, and they knew each other. Right. You have loved ones who've gone on, who are saved, and they've gone on to be with the Lord. Guess what? They know each other. They know each other. Amen. I mean, Ruth, your mom and dad are in heaven. Amen. And they're there, and they, when uh, your, your dad went first, and then your mom. Uh, and so when your dad went and your mom went, uh, she's waiting on him. There's life after death. Amen. Now, and so think about it now. All right, uh, the Pharaohs who lived in Egypt, they believed in life after death. You know, if you lived in Egypt and uh, if somehow or another you were chosen to be a, a, a servant or a maid or a, a, a close to the Pharaoh, you said, boy, that'd be a great honor. In well, other words, Pharaoh, uh, he's, he's uh, might say, the richest man in the world. How would you like to work for the richest man in the world and have that? But when he died, they killed you. Right. They buried all, everything that Pharaoh owned. Every living thing he owned was killed and buried in that, in that uh, uh, pyramid with him because they believed in life after death. And so... Uh, are you ready to die? Boy, I tell you what. And so uh, Egypt had a, a, a god. It was a god of the underworld. But there are 13 verses in the Bible that make it very plain that there is life after death. 13 verses. Where are they found, preacher? I want you to turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. You know these verses. They've been preached on so many times you could quote the verses. Luke chapter 16. We find here the words of Jesus. Luke 16, 19. This is the reality of life after death. Jesus said, here's what Jesus said. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have what? Mercy. Ooh, there it is again. Have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. 
Then he said, this is what the rich man said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify to them. Watch what he says. Lest they also come into this place of what? Torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let, let your five brothers hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will what? Repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because you know the story very well. Just to make this point about life after death, are you ready? Are you ready to die? Are you ready to face eternity right now this morning? Miss Kathy gave a testimony that she thought she was saved. But it wasn't until later in life she was married. She'd been teaching in Sunday school and working in church. And she was not even a, not even a saved person. I, uh, I thought about this. I think it was either W.A. Criswell or, or R.G. Lee said that the, one of the greatest mission fields in America is the church roll book. You'd be surprised, and I'd be surprised how many people's name are on a church roll book who are not going to go to heaven when they die. Amen. Are you listening to me? Your name on a church roll book does, does not mean your name is on the Lamb's book of life in heaven. Amen. So I thought about this, uh, uh, about what the Bible says here in Luke chapter 16. You have two men here, and one is poor and one is rich. In, in the world today, we have folks that are very poor, and we have folks that are very wealthy, and then you have all those in between. Amen? Now, where do, you, where do you consider yourself to be? Are you very poor? Are you, are you as poor as this man uh, who had nothing and no one, and he laid at the gate full of sores, hoping the rich man would take the leftover, the, the crumbs from his table? His only companion were the dogs. I don't think you're that poor. And then you have the one who is very rich, the rich man named Lazarus. Very wealthy man. Could this have been the rich man who came to Jesus, asked him about eternal life? I don't know. And Jesus, you know, here's what you need to do. And he said, I've done all those things. And Jesus says, well, take everything you got, sell it and come and give it to the poor and come follow me. And the man said he couldn't do that. Could that be this rich man? I don't know. But I do know this. Uh, he's rich. So one only, one has only the dogs to comfort him. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have, he's skinny, he, he's frail, he, he's, got, he's got sores all over him, and his only companionship and his only comfort is the dogs that come and lick his wounds, lick his sores. Now the rich man, he, his company is people of royalty. He, uh, he, no doubt he is an affluent man. No doubt he has money. He, can, he can ha has more to eat than he, than he knows what to do with. He has servants. So we have two different men here. And uh, notice Lazarus' name is given. A man named Lazarus. But you notice the rich man's name is not given. Well. Doesn't give his name. Now I thought about that for a few moments. Think about this now. Uh, uh, when people die without, without the Lord, they die lost. <laughs> you end up in hell. What good is your name in hell? See, on the earth, your name may can get you somewhere. On the earth, your name may can do something. But in hell, it can't do nothing. Amen. Think of all the, all the famous people who have died lost. Their name won't mean a thing in hell. Amen. Not a thing. They were famous here, rich here, popular here, but in hell that name won't mean a thing. Oh my, so Lazarus, his name. And what, uh, what about your name? Now I thought about this. It says in verse 22, when you look at that verse 22, it says, uh, and it came to pass 
It says, here they are, they both. The rich man's eating. Boy, he's got it made. He was clothed in purple and fine linen. Lazarus poor. The dogs are licking his sores. He's waiting on the crumbs from the rich man's table. And then it came to pass. You want to underline that? Because that's going to happen to you and I. The, it's going to come to pass for us to die. Death comes this way. You ready to die? Preacher, I don't want to talk about dying. And I, Why would you not want to talk about dying if you're saved? Mom. Why would you sit there and, and be in somewhat uh, trembling about talking about dying? Well, a lost person better tremble. A lost person better, better uh, get shaken up a little bit. But a saved person doesn't have to fear. Now, you may, be, you may be concerned about your loved ones who are lost and uh, hell, may, hell may bother you about them. That's why you need to do what he, he should have done. He said, send them, send them to my house. I got five brothers headed here. And maybe you need to tremble for their salvation. And so uh, it came to pass. Notice it also that one is buried. The rich man is buried. Can you imagine the funeral this man had? Can you imagine the people who came to his funeral? Did you hear about? Did you hear about so and so? Yeah, he, he was taken pretty quickly. He didn't uh, he just said he came to pass? Was he sick? Don't know. But he died. No doubt, everybody, everybody who knew everybody came to that man's funeral. But notice it says here that Lazarus died, but it does not say he was buried. You see, him being a beggar and had nobody to care for him. Most likely, they took his body. Somebody, somebody, somewhere took that body. It's laying there in the street dead. And maybe they cover their face to, and, and pick him up and take him over to the trash dump, Gehenna, the Bible calls it, right. where they threw the trash and dead dogs and animals. That's where they threw it, in the valley of Gehenna. And Jesus referred to that when he used the word hell. Amen. And they took, they took the body of Lazarus and just threw it in the, in the pit. No burial. No, uh, probably, they probably said after he saw his body out there, get that thing out of here. Oh my goodness, get him out of my gate. He's dead. Get rid of him. He's a nuisance. Whew. So one was buried, one was not. Lazarus the beggar is Lazarus the beggar is carried to Abraham's bosom. What was carried? His body was carried to the trash heap, but his soul was carried to Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom speaks of heaven. His soul was carried to heaven. Job said, if a man die, shall he live again? Yes, he will. Here's evidence of it. Here's proof of it from the word of God. And so uh, the rich man died. Oh, my. Lazarus died. He was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That's a type of paradise. The rich man, he dies, and the Bible says, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Is her life after death? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The Bible says here that Lazarus is comforted. On, uh, on the earth, he, said he never had comfort. He had nowhere to go and call home. Had nowhere to uh, lay his head on a nice pillow or bed. Where did he sleep at night? We don't know. But now he is comforted. And the rich man... He's no longer comforted. <clears throat> the Bible says he lift up his eyes being in torments. Not torment, but torment, plural. Oh, my soul. And so we understand nothing else is said about Lazarus. All it says was he is comforted. Amen. Amen. Think about that now. It doesn't go elaborate on this. He was comforted. Aren't you glad that if you're saved, 
When your life here is over and death comes your way, you're going to go to a place of real comfort. Amen. Amen. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy. But no, uh, nothing else is said about Lazarus, but much is said about the rich man. And you know this, and I know this, that the Lord Jesus Christ had more to say about the place called hell than he did a place called heaven. Now, he said a lot about heaven, but he said a whole lot more about hell. He warned people about hell. He talked about, preached about that. Jesus was a hellfire preacher. And you got these fellows today who say, oh, Jesus, uh, he never raised his voice. He, he was always comforting people, always caring for people. But I'm telling you, Jesus was a hellfire brimstone preacher. Amen. Amen. Yes, he was full of compassion. Yes, he, he, uh, he, had, he loved people. He cared for people. But I'm telling you, he was, he was a dynamic preacher. Torments, plural. Notice what the rich man did. He cried out. Look what he says in verse number 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, watch now, have mercy on me. Now watch what he says. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. That's a lot of things about this stand out. He recognizes Lazarus. He sees, he, do you realize when people go to hell, they got perfect vision? Do you realize in hell, every, all your senses are more alive than they ever will be? He looks across that great gulf. Father Abraham, I'm in torments. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and come and cool my tongue. Now, what good is uh, what good would that do him? That goes to show you the torment of hell. Amen. Do you know of anybody in hell right now? I do. Amen. Do you? Do you, know, do you know anybody that's alive now that's not saved that's going to hell? Do you? If you do, are you praying for them? Have you witnessed to them? Have you warned them? Have you told them about the amazing saving grace of Jesus Christ? If you have, that's wonderful. Whoo! He cried for Lazarus for water off his finger, off his finger. Two drops. Would have done him no good. I'm tormented. Cried for Lazarus. He said, for I'm tormented in this what? Flame. Now we're talking about his soul. His body was buried, but his soul was translated uh, to the place called hell. Amen. There, is, there is a place, there is life after death in this flame, his soul. He said, send him over. And Father Abraham said, you know, this impossible. He can't come to you, you can't go to him because there is a great gulf fixed. A fixed gulf do you realize that those in hell will never, 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 never get out? The only time they'll escape hell is when God resurrects them for the great white throne judgment and then hurls them into the lake of fire. That's the second resurrection. They'll never get out. It's a great gulf fix. It cannot come to you. You can't go to them. He noticed he wanted his five brothers warned in verse 28. Five brothers send some, let, let somebody go back and tell my five brothers in this place. I got news for you. Folks in hell right now, if they could come back, just one could come back, you know what would be on their lips? Get saved, get saved, get saved. Don't go to hell, don't go to hell. That's what they do. But folks wouldn't believe it. He said so. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe those one came back from the grave. 
So if they won't believe the Word of God, they won't believe preaching and preaching, they won't believe the gospel. If somebody were to come back, they wouldn't believe it. That's odd, oh, that nothing. You just try to scare me. I'm telling you, hell ought to scare lost people. It may not, but it should. It's a great gulf fix. He wanted his five brothers saved. They were, they were a religious family. Now, how do I know they were a religious family? He said, Father Abraham. That means it was a Jewish family. Here was a highly religious family that no doubt thought, boy, you know, we are the lineage of Abraham and we're God's chosen people and so it just makes sense. We're all going to go to heaven. You don't go to heaven because of your lineage. Amen. You don't go to heaven because of your pedigree. Right. If anybody's going to go to heaven, it's because of what they do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I had a, a conversation two or three times years ago with a local businessman in town. I won't mention his name. He was, he, he was a Jewish man, and I became good friends. And, and I knew he was Jewish, and I, I began to talk to him about the Lord Jesus. And I asked him, I said, uh, uh, do you know you're going to go to heaven when you die? He said, oh, yeah, I know I'm going to heaven. I said, what makes you so sure of that? He said, well, you know, he said, uh, uh, God, God made a promise to, to us. We're God's chosen people. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, do you believe the Old Testament? He said, yes, I do. I said, can I show you some scripture out of the Old Testament? So I showed him some scripture out of the Old Testament that pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he wouldn't believe it. Now, I didn't pressure him, didn't pressure him. And uh, I said, I tell you what, I am going to pray for you. He said, why? I said, I'm going to pray for you that you will see that Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. Because nobody goes to heaven because of, of their nationality. Right. Now, if that was, and here's why God is no respecter of what? Right. Persons. Right. And so, there was a, a religious certificate, a baptismal certificate, is no good when it comes to heaven. Great gulf fixed. One of his five brothers had his religion. Oh, my. I wrote this down. Poverty does not send people to heaven. The beggar did not go to heaven because he was poor. He just happened to be poor. Amen. And riches does not send people to hell. But now riches will hinder some folks because they'll love that riches more than God. We found that out with that young rich ruler. And so... Uh, a person's position in life does not determine where they're going to go. That person's relationship with God matters. Heaven and hell is determined by what you do with Jesus Christ. What you do with him. Now most of you here, you have done with Christ what you should do and you believed on him. You've trusted him. You called upon him sincerely. You saw yourself in sin. Your sin condemns you. I don't want to die in my sins. I want my sins to be forgiven. I want Christ to save me. And so uh, you called upon Christ by faith. And he saved you and you're here today because of that. Amen. And the day that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth, that day your sins were washed away. That day God wrote your name down the Lamb's Book of Life. That day God gave you his Holy Spirit. Amen. And so much more. Wow. And so Christ is the bridge over that great gulf. He is the bridge. He's the way over. Hell is real. Heaven is real. Oh. Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Do you know that? Amen. Think about this. The thief on the cross. I've referred to him the last year a good bit. The thief on the cross when, when, you, when you read this, the Gospels and it talks about these two thieves, it, it does not give their name. Hmm? Now, Barabbas is mentioned. He was the third thief. But the other two thieves' names are not mentioned. But that day, somehow or another, 
that thief, that man on the right hand side, not on the left hand side, they both saw and heard everything that happened that day. They saw and heard it. They did. And the thief on the right, at, at first, they, they rail on Jesus. If you are who you say you are, save yourself and save us. And Jesus didn't say a word. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. No seven sayings of Jesus. But somehow or another, the, the thief on the right realized this is the Son of God. This is who he says he is. Now the man on the left could have, could have, he saw, he could have done the same thing. He railed on Jesus, save yourself and save us. And the thief over here said, hey, hey, we're getting what we deserve. That's what he said. And he looked at Jesus and watch now. He said, would you remember me when you get into your kingdom, into your kingdom, the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, Talking about life after death, Jesus said, today, today, thou shalt be with what? Me in paradise. Yeah. Amen. And he's there today. Aren't you glad? Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Who? It takes a new birth, John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. And in your song book is a hymn called You Must Be Born Again. I want you to take and turn to it if you would. It's 474 in your song book. I believe it is 474. It's entitled You Must Be Born Again. You see that uh, That, that beggar Lazarus, he believed, he believed in his God. Hmm? The rich man did. 474. Have you been born again? Have you? Amen. I have. What a blessing. A ruler once came to Jesus by night to ask him the way of salvation and light. The master made answer in words true and plain. You must be born again. Ye children of men, attend to the word so solemnly uttered by Jesus the Lord. And let not this message to you be in vain. You must be born again. O oh, ye who would enter that glorious rest and sing with the ransom the song of blessed. The life everlasting, if ye would o obtain, ye must be born again. A dear one in heaven, thy heart yearns to see at the beautiful gate, may be watching for thee. Then listen to the note of this solemn refrain, ye must be born again. Is there life after death? It sure is. Amen. And it's a life that's going to be forever and ever and ever. And to have that life in that, in that place called heaven, you must have a second birth. You must have it. For without it, you're not going to go there. You're going to miss it. And it came to pass, the verse said, that the beggar died and the rich man died. It's going to come to pass for you. Amen. For the bride, would you come? We're going to pray, and we're going to sing this song. Now, here's my, here's my invitation for you. If you've never been born again, and you know you're not saved, why don't you come this morning and get this thing settled? Get it settled this morning. I'm telling you, death may knock on your door today or this week. Are you ready? Huh? Or if you've got loved ones that are, that are not saved, a wife, a husband, kids, brothers, moms, and dads, I mean, do you really care about their soul? Huh? They may not care about their soul, but do you care about their soul? Your prayer can make a difference in their life. And your witness can make a difference in their life. Would you do it? Would you put them on your prayer list today and pray for their salvation to come? Would you? Let's ask God to do it. Lord Jesus, thank you for helping me preach again this morning. Lord, I owe it all to you. 
Thank you for washing away my sins at the age of 19. Thank you, dear God, for writing my names down the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I pray now, Lord, for this invitation. There may be somebody here this morning, a lady, a man, a child, a teenager, who's never been born again, and they know it, and nobody else does but you. So, Lord, I pray that you'll burden their heart, really burden their heart, that they'll, they'll see themselves needing to be saved. God, would you do that? And Lord, help us to see uh, our loved ones and friends who are lost. Lord, help us to see them get saved. Help us to pray for them. We ask you to do it in our life and in their life. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen.